Can you guys hear me okay with this? Does this work in the back? It's okay? All right. So as Carol mentioned, I work for the National Marine Sanctuary Program. It's a federal program. And I'm focused right now on working here in the Channel Islands. California actually has four National Marine Sanctuaries. The Channel Islands is one of them. I am the Social Science Program Coordinator. That's kind of a fancy way of saying that my job is to collect scientifically rigorous data and other information <clears throat> and give it to the sanctuary and help them interpret that information so that it informs their management and policy decisions. And I'm going to tell you a bit about that in, a, in this talk. <clears throat> Before I get started, how many of you are boaters? And how many boat here in the Channel Islands? You have some of you guys out there. And, have, and how many of you guys take your boat to the Channel Islands? Oh, good. And some students as well? Who are, who's a student? OK, great. All right. And one, one last thing is, are all of you more or less familiar with the Channel Islands National Park and uh, the sanctuary itself? Who's not? Who, or who is, feels pretty comfortable with understanding the basics, the boundaries, and so on? Somewhat? A little bit? OK. So I'll also provide some contextual information. What's that? Who's, who, who feels like they know a lot about it already? A few. OK. OK. All right, so let's just get started right away. <clears throat> Can you guys dim the lights a little bit? This, this really bright light in my eyes. And also, this slide has something important in the background that's a little easier to see. How about that one? Can you dim that light? Oh, that's videotaping, OK. So uh, you guys can probably see the shark in the, back, in the background. This is actually a real picture. It wasn't doctored up or created with a computer. And it's just kind of a nice opener. And it's also meant to, <laughs> to, kind of, to kind of get you thinking about how important it is to have good information, especially spatially referenced information on your surroundings. That's the way we like to think of it here at the sanctuary. And <clears throat> as you can see, that if, if you don't have the right information at the right time, you can give off the wrong signals. Some of you are probably divers. And you can see this diver is giving the OK sign. <laughs> He's ready to proceed with the dive. Everything is fine. Well, clearly, everything is not OK with this person right now. So <clears throat> I will tell you the rest of the story regarding this photo at the end. <laughs> so you'll have to stay awake through the whole presentation to find out. So if you're also thinking, well, yes, it's important to have information, but do we really have to have it here in the Channel Islands? Well, this photo was taken Labor Day weekend this year at Smuggler's Co., which is one of the most often visited uh, areas in the Channel Islands. And I don't know how many vessels that is, but it's a lot. It was taken during an aerial survey <clears throat> that the, uh, of one of many that the sanctuary conducts. Uh, where they actually observe vessels. So tonight I'm going to talk about all the information that we have on boating and boaters. So <clears throat> that includes information that the sanctuary has been collecting for quite a while now, almost 10 years for this aerial survey data that they, that they acquire, <clears throat> as well as a boating study that I'm in charge of and that has been going on now for almost two years. And we're going to finish all of our data collection, fingers crossed, in November of this year. It's not just about boating. It's uh, also on boating activities, since that is, of course, a very important part of the human dimension in the Channel Islands. First, I'll just mention the, the big things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you a little bit more background and context. That's why I was asking how comfortable people are in their knowledge of the Channel Islands and the National Park. I'm going to talk about, in particular, about this, this study I just referenced, uh, which is about two years. Uh, in length so far. And I'm calling it part one because as the social science program at the sanctuary develops, we will almost certainly undertake other studies uh, that won't be focused just on boating and so on. So this is kind of the first part as we envision it. I'm going to actually share some of the data, mostly by way of graphs and charts, and talk a little bit about it and what's forthcoming. And then I'm going to tell you how that information is applicable to management and policy at the sanctuary. <clears throat> and with its sanctuary's partners. So first, starting with the background and context, 
uh, I guess I should define what we mean by the human dimension. What we mean is more than just collecting data about socioeconomics or the socioeconomic monitoring, uh, but we're also meaning um, our education and outreach, was a, which is a big program and component of the sanctuary program. <clears throat> And of course, law enforcement, because we have rules in the sanctuary and someone's out there enforcing them. Before I forget, for the most part, the monitoring that, that I'm involved with is, is focused on the marine reserves, uh, which were put in place almost five years ago in the sanctuary. And I'll, I'll get to, again, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but <clears throat> just keep that in mind. So socioeconomic monitoring is the one part of the human dimension that I'm focusing on tonight. And I'll give you a quick background. These are the sort of the three main elements of socioeconomic monitoring of the sanctuary. The first is what we call testing predictions. So when these reserves I just mentioned were put in place almost five years ago, some economists at NOAA, actually based in Silver Spring back in Washington, D.C. area, uh, used available data to kind of predict uh, the, what they called the maximum potential impact to humans of putting these reserves in. That would mean uh, sort of displacing fishing efforts to other parts of the sanctuary, impacts to businesses and uh, profitability, uh, and, and generally any impact to, to, to the local economy. <clears throat> so what we're doing five or ten years hence is we're kind of revisiting those predictions in this program and saying, well, now that we're getting more and better information, the reserves have been in place, um, how well were we able to sort of predict? And, uh, and also, it's kind of a promise we made to the stakeholders that we would revisit those predictions and tell them whether or not they were accurate and meaningful. <clears throat> two and three are kind of my main job for the long run. Um, number two, data on human and marine interactions. Again, that's kind of a fancy way of saying we want to, with scientifically rigorous information, be able to create a, a good picture of the human dimension or humans interacting with the sanctuary, with the coastal marine environment. And specifically, we want to know about the parts of that picture that are relevant to the management decisions that the park and the sanctuary and the Department of Fish and Game have to make, and the overall policy decisions that might even be made at a, at a state level. Number three is ecosystem-based management. That is a, a relatively new term in science new meaning in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so. And what it means is that scientists want to not just look at a specific sort of disciplinary, you know, looking at one discipline when they, when they talk about collecting information and informing policy, they want to think more holistically. So they want to think in terms of an entire ecosystem and how it's functioning and its integrity and how different trophic interactions are occurring and how all that relates to humans and the things that people care about and, and human well-being. So we're working toward that. Um, as you probably uh, guessed, it's a very complicated and, and consuming thing. So it's not going to happen overnight. As I said, the idea came up I, maybe 10 years ago. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on it. So it's, it's already been in the works for a while. But I put it up there because whenever I design some new part of the program, I'm thinking about how it can be integrated into an ecosystem-based management approach. And ultimately, as I mentioned, what we're wanting to do is get good information, this top of the right information at the right time, experience partners to inform what's called adaptive management of marine reserves. So marine reserves were put in place, the idea being that over time we would monitor things and collect information and make changes uh, according to what we're seeing. To get into a little more detail about socioeconomic monitoring, why do we want to understand human use? Because we, we, it's, it's clearly um, human use and the motivations of human beings in the sanctuary is integral to one of the main goals of the park, the sanctuary, and the Department of Fish and Game, and that is restoring and maintaining the ecological integrity of this place. Some of the resources over the past 20 years, data indicated and uh, pretty clearly depleted, so seeing that those resources recover is, is also an objective. And understanding what humans are doing out there is, is um, I think, intuitively obvious, uh, obviously important. So again, why socioeconomic monitoring even further uh, as it relates to adaptive management? Well, because uh, we're, adaptive management is in some sense really more about managing people than actually managing wildlife. We can manage ourselves. And there's this interaction between science and society as well because we're collecting what we hope is objective and scientifically rigorous information and sharing it with society. 
And as Gary Davis, the chief scientist of the National Park, used to say to me, we can negotiate with humans, but we can't with fish. And uh, again, he's just making that point that um, we, can, we can manage ourselves and, and hope that what we do will allow um, depleted populations to recover, for example, and ecosystems to regenerate or maintain their integrity, <clears throat> but we can't uh, tell them what to do. Humans, yes, there are a lot of humans in the vicinity of the Channel Islands. About 18 million people uh, live in, in, in relative terms fairly close. And those 18 million people in, in global terms are actually quite wealthy and there's a lot of income concentrated in Southern California. And then why is that important? Well, it's important because it allows people to go out and recreate and make choices to buy boats and use them and have a, a real tangible presence <clears throat> in proximity to park and sanctuary. Just a quick bit about the Channel Islands management. Some of you are hearing me talk about multiple agencies, federal agencies like the Sanctuary Program to which I belong, uh, the National Park Program, also a federal program, and the Department of Fish and Game, which is a state program. And in many ways, Fish and Game is our state counterpart and our partner. Um, the park and the sanctuary have, generally speaking, um, three major components to their mandate. One is, uh, number one is to kind of preserve and restore resources, generally, as I've been talking about. But um, to, the, to the extent possible to allow human use of these places. So they're kind of striking a balance there. And again, that's why they need good information about humans, human well-being, and what's motivating humans to do things so they can understand how best to manage human activities to allow for the greatest human use while still uh, upholding their number one objective, which is to preserve and restore resources where necessary. And the third is to, to monitor, again, to collect information to inform these decisions. Channel Islands management has a fairly long history. Um, the uh, National Park that was established as the 40th National Park in 1980. As I mentioned, these marine reserves, also called no-take marine reserves because you can't take anything from them, were established in 2003 in state waters, that is from the high tide marked out to three nautical miles, and more recently this year um, out to in federal waters, which is from the three mile limit to the six mile nautical mile limit. And I'll show you a graph of, or actually a figure of that. You can see the Channel Islands and let's see the the, the black perimeter is the sanctuary boundary, and the, the red zones are the marine reserves, <clears throat> inside of which, again, is, it's, it's no-take, so uh, you cannot take, according to the law, abiotic or biotic material. It means no fishing and no collection of, of dead stuff like rocks or any archaeological materials and so on. You can see Santa Barbara Island, so don't forget that. But um, when I talk about the Channel Islands, I'm talking about these islands, San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, Anacapa, and off by itself, Santa Barbara. Okay, so as I mentioned, I will talk now about boating and data that we have. Uh, that's the end of the contextual information part. <laughs> Sorry. So again, um, or actually, I should make this point. There are kind of two types of boats you could take to access the Channel Islands. Um, one we call the private boat, and that's when someone actually owns their boat and they can take it out on their own. They pay for it. The other way to get out by boat is to go onto a charter uh, boat, such as a charter dive or a fishing boat or whale watching vessel or island packers boat, for example, if you wanted to go camping for a weekend. Our study is entirely focused on private boats, private boating, and all the activities that people enjoy from their boats. Another study, which was done some time ago, um, was focused on the charter side. So first of all, let's just uh, mention what's being studied. Um, <clears throat> well, we want to know where boaters go and what they do and what activities they enjoy. That's the spatial use, boating and activities. And we want to ask them questions about their expenditures with which we can estimate the economic contribution or the economic impact that they make to the local community or the state of California, whichever the case may be. And <clears throat> we also recognize, and by the way, all that information is, is quantitative and much of it is spatially referenced. 
And, but in addition to that, we collect what we call qualitative information because we recognize that we need to understand how people perceive their trips to the Channel Islands, what their attitudes are toward things like marine reserves and, and the different management strategies and, strategies and policies of the park and the sanctuary. And we'd also like to know how much information and knowledge people have about the sanctuary, its boundaries, its mandate, the park, et cetera, and especially marine reserves. And number four, environmental attributes. What is that? Well, we don't want just information about people and where they go, what they do, their economic contribution, how they feel about the place, and so on. We actually want to reference those things to specific parts of the sanctuary and the park. And that's what I'm calling environmental attributes. So an example of an attribute that um, is also relevant to a marine reserve would be the diversity and abundance of a variety of fish species or invertebrate species. So the, the hope is that by creating a marine reserve over the long haul, you might um, see some of those previously depleted populations recover. So that attribute would ostensibly be enhanced. And you know, ultimately what we'd like to know is how that affects human well-being how that affects people's decisions to go to different places, how it affects their level of satisfaction, and ultimately the kind of economic contribution they make and so on. So we want, down the road, we're not ready to do this yet, but ultimately we'd like to have an idea of what that connection is between the environment, the environmental health, if you will, the ecological integrity of the Channel Islands, uh, coastal marine environments, and people and their well-being. <clears throat> now, I've got a quite a few slides on this, you know, the instruments that we use for this study. So I'll go through them kind of fast, and if people are kind of nodding off, I'll know to go faster, but um, because it, it's, it's actually a lot of work. But we have, let's see, four different survey instruments. And the first is what we call our postcard survey. What do we use that for? Well, this <clears throat> is a very simple survey instrument that uh, we want to completely blanket the boater population in Santa Barbara and Ventura County with. And it asks people to give us very brief information about, A, whether or not they even use their boat to go to the Channel Islands, and if so, to which region or portion of the Channel Islands they have visited recently, and a couple of other sort of choice pieces of information. That gives us the basis for determining what we call sort of the, the participation rate among, amongst boaters here in these two local counties for going to the Channel Islands, because ultimately we're going to want to see how that participation rate changes. If there are, for example, 20,000 boats in those two counties and only a fifth of them actually go to the Channel Islands, that's important for us to know. And it's important for us to know that five or ten years from now, maybe half of them go. So that helps us understand and anticipate the kind of visitation rate and the human pressure on these places. That's a, a simple mailback postcard, and um, if you uh, own a boat that is in a slip in this harbor, for example, you should have received this postcard along with your slip bill. Uh, and it wasn't junk mail, so I hope you didn't throw it away. But if you did, you can go online and also take this. And by the way, this postcard says if you are a person that goes to the Channel Islands, in your boat, <clears throat> we'd like to hear even more from you, and it attempts to recruit people to our web page, or, or the web page we use to support a web-based survey, which is the next one here, and that's at oceanstudy.net. What does that do? Well, that sort of screens for the people who use their vessels to go to the Channel Islands, tries to get them to go to this website and ask them more particular information about things like the anchorages they like to visit. Uh, the specific activities they might like to do with those anchorages and their, their expenditures and some details about their vessels. Now, some people think, well, why do I, why do I need to include all this detailed information about my last trip? Well, again, we, we need that information because we're economists and we like to model the economic impact and we like to be able to report that to the sanctuary and to the government. <clears throat> and, um, well, it doesn't always seem uh, intuitive to people. We, we actually need those details to do that. Okay, that's number two. <laughs> Getting tired already. The third one, however, is actually the most fun for me. It's the in-person interview. And we realized long ago that we needed some what we call fine-scale spatial information about what people do. So that means uh, we, we want to know in a very detailed way 
where people go diving, go kayaking, view wildlife, for example, from their vessels. Because there are certain places in the Channel Islands that are kind of really ecologically special, if you will, and that they, they support a lot of um, flora and fauna that people like for, because they like to catch it with a rod and reel, spear it with a spear, or just look at it or photograph it, for example. Um, <clears throat> but it's highly variable, or as we say, heterogeneous over time and space. So we needed to actually use a geographic information system. And we realized this is the kind of thing you can just ask over the phone or with a simple postcard. You actually need to sit down with someone. So what we did was we got someone to write a program in a geographic information system platform. And we actually got the sanctuary to let us use their research vessel, the Shearwater. And we took this program and sure, we were using the sheer water and we went out, we launched a skiff and we decided uh, on a good way to sort of tactfully and respectfully approach boaters in anchorages where they're relaxed and say, how would you like to come aboard the NOAA research vessel and take a tour and learn a little bit more about the sanctuary if you want. And all we ask is that you take our survey. And most of the time people said yes, if they were available. <clears throat> and by the way, we got this idea during focus groups where we, asked a lot of highly avid boaters to get together with us in, in three different harbors. And, and we said, you know, we want to get this information. And they said, that's fine. We don't mind sharing it. But don't ask me at the dock when I'm doing my varnish because I'll be too busy. And don't ask me when I'm on my way to work. And don't ask me here. And then we finally said, well, <laughs> where, where can we actually sit down with you? Because it's a kind of an involved process. And they said, well, I'm most relaxed when I'm out at the Channel Islands and, at, and comfortably at anchor. So that sort of set the ball rolling for us. <clears throat> Number three, it says naturalist core. What is that? Well, that has worked so well for us that I thought I'd, I'd mention it. And there are some naturalist core members here who have actually been involved in this. And so I'm thanking them right now in advance. But um, what it is, is it's a volunteer program supported by the sanctuary through which um, people learn and acquire a lot of information actually about the sanctuary and its environments and habitats and they share that information through various venues like whale watching trips and so on. So these people are just tailor made for this particular task with us and it's it's just again it's worked beautifully from my point of view because they're so knowledgeable uh, they tend to also know quite a bit about boating many of them are boaters and so when they approach a boater at anchor um, they're able to sort of speak from that uh, place of, of having local knowledge and so on. So that uh, seems to really help sort of grease the wheel, if you will. And it's, it's really worked beautifully for us and it's made it hands down the most enjoyable survey process for me. <clears throat> so again, for you Natural Score volunteers, thank you very much. Couldn't thank you enough. Um, I mentioned this program that we're using. This is what it looks like. This is what we call a screen grab or screen capture. So it's just a, basically a computer screen and it's a nifty little program that allows us to zoom in and out on digitized uh, nautical charts. And wh while we have a boater with us and we go through a structured process and we ask them to essentially tell us where they go and what they do and indicate that by drawing these polygons. You can see there's this green one here in Smuggler's Cove. It, probably corresponds to exploration by a dinghy or something. And then that is logged by the computer automatically as what we call a shape file. <clears throat> so that's how that works. Oh, finally, the fourth survey. This is the qualitative information I mentioned. The knowledge of sanctuary reserves, the attitudes toward reserves, and I guess what's really important to us is learning about whether or not people actually think these reserves will work. <laughs> Believe it or not, the sanctuary really does care about that, and they want to know if, if the people out there in the sanctuary using these resources, who obviously care about them, <clears throat> perceive, at least at this point in time, whether reserves will be successful in meeting their objectives of uh, maintaining or restoring ecological integrity and so on. By the way, if you want to know a lot of the specific objectives of reserves, they are well laid out and articulated at the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary website. That's just too much to try and present at this, at this talk. But again, as part of the monitoring program, it's not that we just want to know right now um, whether people think they will work. We want to know over time if those perceptions change. And over time, what we'd like to do is try and <clears throat> 
combine that data collection with our education and outreach so as to help us figure out if to what extent I guess the education and outreach is making a difference and <clears throat> also just to learn how people's attitudes and level of knowledge and perceptions might be changing about reserves and other things over the long haul and I mean long haul as in five or ten years so as I mentioned I will share some of our sample data by way of graphs and charts <clears throat> as a reminder the um, we had intended to have all of our data collected by now, um, but we don't quite have enough responses to some of our surveys, not all of them. So we've kind of left the data acquisition phase open, I think it's until about mid-November. So I'll show you data that are, is uh, from an incomplete data set, so please don't try to interpret them at this point, but uh, just realize that we have quite a bit of data, but it's not all the data we will collect, so we're not at this point drawing any hard and fast conclusions or making inferences, and we haven't statistically analyzed it, for example, or anything like that yet. <clears throat> Before I show you the data from our study, I will show you a little bit of the data from the aerial monitoring program the sanctuary has had in place for a long time and that I mentioned because it was kind of a springboard of information from which we are sort of building greater levels of detail and so on. This, this chart shows observed vessels. SAMSAP is a fancy acronym, don't even ask me what it means, but it's for the aerial monitoring program. And it's actually for quite a long period. That's 1997 through 2006. And each of these lines is actually corresponds to a category of vessel. I didn't make these categories, so um, and somebody asked me, what is a head boat the other day? And I, I, I know that it's a, like a charter fishing party boat, but I couldn't tell you why it's called a head boat. But as you can see, there are you know, these lines that kind of indicate the sort of relative frequency with which during these aerial surveys, different vessels were observed in the Channel Islands. And it's a very structured process of using an airplane to, to do flyovers, and they use a grid to actually <clears throat> do what amounts to a transect, where they're observing vessels by category and logging that. And as I said, they've been doing it for quite a long time. I think fairly soon we'll have a, a, an entire decade worth of data. One interesting thing that I can't explain yet anyway is this big spike right here. And that corresponds to consumptive recreational vessels and it uh, sort of rises very quickly in 2002, and, and by 2004, it's declining fairly fast. So uh, again, I don't, couldn't tell you why that's happening, but <clears throat> when we're all done, I hope to be able to do that. This is another way to view the aerial flyover data. It's very busy, um, <clears throat> but um, there's so much data that's kind of hard to present in a slide format. But these little dots, and, and they're two different colors. You can see one is kind of a, uh, a light blue and the other is red. And what I asked the, the sanctuary person to do who keeps all these data is to um, differentiate with a color the observations before and after the marine reserves were put into place, just to see if there's anything in, sort of intuitive that we could notice by that. And by the way, we, after talking to lots of recreational fishermen, um, decided that um, recreational fishing effort would probably be displaced in certain ways and when reserves were put in place. We wanted to, again, use these kinds of data to try and figure out um, <clears throat> if that's indeed happening. And you can see that, or actually one thing that we saw from this that's interesting is that there seems to be a lot more activity post-reserve in the southern side of Anacapa. So <clears throat> we think it's possible that um, a lot of effort that might have been sort of distributed all around Anacapa, with the exception of the reserve that's been there a long time, has been some that that's no, it's more focused on the south side. And we don't know that for sure, but that's the kind of idea that we would test using the data we're collecting. This is again from the aerial flyover data, and it's something I asked for when we were designing our surveys and, and sort of scheduling them. I, I said to them, well, is there a pronounced boating season? In other words, do you see many more boats during parts of, part of the year compared to another part? And they said, well, yes, we will aggregate or put together all of our data for this time series 98 to 2006 and show you what it looks like over the course of the year. And that's what this graph shows. So it shows that in January, February, and March, there are relatively few vessels observed. And then all of a sudden, uh, around May, they observe a whole lot more. And then there's a little bit of decline around June, and it starts to rise again through July and August 
kind of peaks around September and then drops off pretty precipitously into December, which is intuitive. This is the first chart which shows some of the data from our postcard survey. So N equals 603, that means that it corresponds to 603 observations or 603 postcards returned to us, which after our kind of quality control, um, we accepted and sort of adopted into our data set. We're hoping by the end, by the way, to have more like a thousand um, returned postcards. And what this chart shows is uh, essentially where people like to go. So in the postcard we said, you know, if you go to the Channel Islands, tell us where you like to go. And then I've sort of arranged the different places from the most visited to the least. And you can see that Santa Cruz North was most often mentioned. A little more than 70% of the people said they go there. Pretty close in second was the Santa Cruz South Side, followed by Anna Kappa, and then Catalina. We didn't just ask about visitation to, Santa, uh, sorry, to, to the Channel Islands because we know that boats go other places and we also wanted to see, relatively speaking, where else they're going and how often they visit those other places compared to the Channel Islands. So we included things like guest slips because during focus groups, boaters said, you know, sometimes I don't go to the Channel Islands at all. I just take my boat out and I might go to another harbor to a guest slip and meet some friends or do something. So we kept that in mind. <clears throat> This is a similar slide that shows um, participation in recreational activities. So again, we asked people not only whether or not they use their boat to go to the Channel Islands, but, if, but um, when they do, what do they like to do when they're there? <clears throat> and I've sort of tried to break it down to, into uh, two categories that we think of, and that is uh, consumptive versus non-consumptive activities. Consumptive activities being things like hook and line fishing, lobster diving, spear fishing, and hoop netting, for example. So <clears throat> you can see that uh, relaxing and exploring <laughs> are really big with boaters. And by the way, these aren't mutually exclusive things. If you have a postcard, you can check any, none of the boxes that correspond to these activities or all of them or some portion of them. So some, often boaters did many things, including relaxing plus exploring and kayaking and so on. Relaxing and exploring are, are the most popular things, but followed by kayaking and diving and also hook and line fishing. I should mention that um, <clears throat> one difficulty we've had is getting an adequate number of responses from people who don't have boats that are stored in a slip, but boats that are stored on a trailer. It's just for whatever reason, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, difficult to get those people <clears throat> Not have to respond, their response rate is just as good as anyone else's, but to, to actually get a survey into their hands. <clears throat> so this particular data set quite represents who have their boats in slips as opposed to boaters who have their boats in, on a trailer. And um, anyway, I won't go into more, more into that, but um, <clears throat> when we actually completely write our reports and everything, you'll, and, and all this information will be made publicly available, we'll, We'll delve into that a lot deeper if you'd like to know. But still, I think for me, one, one notable thing was the relatively high incidence of hook and line fishing. <clears throat> Almost half the people uh, said that they, at some point in time, like to fish. And that's pretty important for us at the sanctuary to know. OK, so I've shown you some of the data. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that means to us as the sanctuary and exactly where the rubber meets the road in terms of ma management and policy, so to speak. What are we actually going to do with this survey data? Well, initially, it will, it will just begin to generally inform the sanctuary about the human dimension. As I mentioned, there, the sanctuary's number one mandate is sort of to preserve, protect, and restore, but allow human use up to the point that it's is feasible without compromising that first uh, objective. So right away, just giving, providing some scientifically rigorous data on um, these aspects of boating, boater behavior, motivations, perceptions, and attitudes, and so on, is going to help the sanctuary <clears throat> achieve that, uh, that sort of balance that needs to strike. The second thing is a bit more complex, but for me, it's a whole lot more interesting. Combined with environmental attributes data. What does that mean? Well, 
It means that once we actually have full data sets and we've analyzed those data statistically, and we kind of have some, a good statistical understanding of where people go, what they do, what their economic contribution is, and so on, then we're going to look for statistical correlations between people's behavior, in other words, their choice of sites and anchorages and activities, and the specific types of environmental attributes in a place that's, that um, help us estimate, predict, or actually explain their behavior over time. And again, some of those things will be directly rela related to marine reserves and the objectives of, of marine reserves, ecological and biological stuff. But a lot of it has nothing to do with that and just helps us understand how in the future we can statistically predict how boater behavior might change if uh, the state or the sanctuary, for example, or the park is considering different management options, which uh, quite obviously would affect people. So if some of those attributes that we can see statistically are highly correlated positively or negatively with people's behavior will be affected by what the, what, the, what the sanctuary wants to do, then we'll be able to talk about exactly what that might mean to human beings and the human and human welfare, I guess, or, or well-being is the better word. How are we going to do that? Well, we're actually going to probably next year or the year after that at the, at the latest estimate uh, these human behavior models. I work pretty closely with a professor at UCLA named Linwood Pendleton. And Linwood's, one of Linwood's specialties is something called a, dis a discrete choice model. And so once we get all the data that I've just mentioned in place, we can use these discrete choice models to help us understand, again, <clears throat> how people's well-being is tied to the sanctuary's attributes, environmental and otherwise, and how changes in those attributes are likely to affect people's well-being. Will humans benefit? Well, of course, we'd like to know that. And we'd like to know, again, how we can maintain the sort of restoration and, and management and good stewardship of, of these areas, which we care about so much, but also try and, and create an environment in which humans will really benefit. I mean. Personally, I, I really believe that if, um, if these coastal areas are not benefiting people that the management practices that uh, our agent, public agencies put in place aren't likely to last or be resilient. So <clears throat> that's one of the things that I think about when I'm trying to understand more about um, how humans are benefiting from marine reserves or not and which humans and over what time frame. Because it's pretty clear after talking to biologists that um, Marine reserves will have a biological and ecological effect. Um, some of those things are, I think, um, can be predicted fairly well, but many of them are very unpredictable and in some cases are hard to perceive with the kind of instruments that we have, even over five or 10 years. <coughs> so again, adaptive management, that one thing that, always, uh, that we're always tethered to, meaning that um, all this information is important ultimately because Reserves are meant to be adaptively managed over time. So changes can occur if we realize that they will help us better achieve that balance between ensuring that the place is protected and well managed and we're being good stewards, and, um, but we're also allowing the most beneficial use for humans. I've been talking in kind of general terms, so I'll mention a couple specific things that we think about. One is what we define as recreational fishing hotspots. Um, one of the, uh, some of the animals that have been depleted, um, according to the data, over the last 20 years include uh, the fish that people like to catch. And so we want to monitor recreational fishing where it is concentrated, that's what we call as hot spots, and find out how um, fishing in those places is changing over time. Specifically, we look at two things. We look at fishing effort and we look at catch by species and species group over time and space. And we're especially focusing on these hot spots. And I'll tell you, we have a very difficult job because ultimately what we'd like to know is what is the effect of a marine reserve at these hot spots on fishing effort, on catch, catch per unit effort by species and species group. And there are so many things that affect recreational fishing, that it's sometimes difficult to tease out the effect that a marine reserve might be having, if, if it's having an effect at all. 
So it's going to take us a long time to actually collect good data and do this. <clears throat> Likewise, we're looking at popular overnight anchorages, like the one at Smuggler's Cove that I showed you at the very beginning, where there were so many vessels anchored. Obviously, there is a human impact, especially during busy weekends when the weather is just really nice and uh, people are not working. And so we want to focus some attention on those places. For example, there is a habitat uh, underwater called eelgrass beds. Uh, they are very sensitive to anchoring. And when you throw your anchor on one and then pull it up, you can remove some of the eelgrass and create kind of a hole. And uh, for whatever reason, um, eelgrass beds have been declining over the last, I think it's 10 years or so. And so the sanctuary is sensitive to that. And there's actually another organization that works on this. But that's an, this is just an example of something that is fairly specific that we're looking at and seeing how we can apply this data and information about human use patterns. And of course, as I mentioned, the links with outreach and education. As we're understanding more about how people perceive this place and management of it and so on, uh, it helps, it puts us in a better position to be more effective with the type of information and the venue of that information that we're, that we're using and investing in. And that is a lot. So I appreciate so much all that you've, all the time that you've taken to listen to all this. Does anyone still want to hear about the shark and what that was? No. Okay. So let me, let me just show you that because it was really interesting. Um, this picture was sent to me by a friend of mine in Australia. <clears throat> it's like I said, it's a real picture. It, and if you diver and I am it, it, when I first saw it I was just I was horrified like my knees were buckling that I mean that shark just looks like a bus with teeth so <clears throat> so here's the story behind it it's, it's the, my friend got this second or third hand but apparently this is a mother and a father and they decided that their 18 year old son should learn to dive and he was willing to do that so they put him through a certification course and then it came time for the checkout dive. So they said, we'd really like to take to our favorite dive site in Southern Australia. He agreed, he said, that's great. So they chartered a dive vessel, the three of them, and they took the vessel out. And they agreed on their dive plan and everything and jumped in the water. And of course, the two parents are facing the child because they're you know, going through all the signs and the training and everything. And the, their child has a little digital camera. So he's holding the camera and he's very excited. And just as he is snapping this picture of his father giving the OK sign, that giant shark appeared in the background. <laughs> well, to his credit, he didn't just drop the camera. He kept it. So we have this interesting photo. He surfaced right away, probably as fast as he possibly could, clambered aboard the boat. And his parents, of course, didn't have any idea what was going on. They never apparently saw the shark. <laughs> they came aboard the boat kind of befuddled, thinking, Whoa. Uh, did you need more time to get accustomed to the waters? He was speechless. He couldn't say a word. <laughs> so he, he actually turned to the operator of the boat who had seen the shark's fin behind them and was pulling up anchor and leaving right away and saying, I'm not even going to tell you what happened until we get back to port. So anyway, that's the story just to fill you in. Anyway, again, thank you very much for your time. Um, I think we, I, I'd be happy to entertain any questions if you, if you have any. OK, um, let's see. One question here up front. So the question is, how were the reserves selected? Oh, boy, that's a long and involved answer. It, it went through a very long public and scientific process that lasted several years before 2003 and involved not only that economic analysis that I mentioned, but a lot of work from biologists and ecologists who were saying these are where the habitats are, these are the types of habitats, and these are areas that we believe could be made into reserves to represent these different habitats and conserve them or manage them and so on. And then again, it went through a very long public process and then ultimately a so-called pre um, preferred alternative of network of marine reserves was given to the California Department of Fish and Games Commission. This commission consists of um, a board of people who are appointed by the governor, and they ultimately decided whether to accept or reject that network. They accepted it, and so we've had it ever since. And again, that was the state water network, which this year was expanded into federal waters. 
Any other quick questions? This one here? Yeah, I'm just curious. You mentioned uh, fishing hotspots, and I'm just curious if there's a correlation between uh, technology has become so advanced now, like chart plotters and right. fish finders and yeah, there's something we're, we're, we're struggling with, and, and this is such an interesting thing for me because I look at data on fishing effort for, from even, even 10, but more like 25 years ago, and I realize that that effort isn't the same as effort today. There's some things that I could name in my hand that are, that are very different now. One is GPSs that are cheap and expensive and easy to use, allow fishermen to consistently, even in poor weather, uh, with low visibility, access and pinpoint where they want to go, and they can go back to those places where there was a bite frequently. Um, <clears throat> fishing gear in the last 25 years has improved. Fishing line and other tackle allow people to more easily fish much deeper waters. Um, boats are better. People are wealthier, so they can afford better boats, and they can afford to go faster farther and in more inclement weather. Um, people like to kayak fish a lot more than they did 25 years ago. Kayak is huge where I live in Santa Cruz. People tend to take their kayaks into the Big Sur Coast, for example, during favorable weather, pat weather patterns, and they fish a lot of spots that were kind of left alone because they were, before the advent of kayak fishing, kind of inaccessible. So fishing effort has changed not only in that people can reach places with better accuracy, um, but they can fish more efficiently. The other thing is the internet has allowed for information sharing on a grand scale that didn't exist 25 years ago. So you can go on to websites like um, Get Bent and Bloody Decks and All Coast and read about and your friends' claims of the big giant fish they just caught yesterday at this point. So then you can go out the next morning at 5.30 and try and, you know, and find the, the group of animals that they were targeting. So again, that didn't exist 25 years ago. So I, my thought or my, my idea is to be tested is that people are able to fish um, in smaller spatial areas because th with the advent of reserves and more fishing regulations, their, their access has been constrained. But they can fish a lot more efficiently and more days and with better gear and equipment, so they can access deeper waters more easily than they could before. So that makes our job just more complicated to try and understand what that means. Other questions? This one? I wanted to ask you about kelp. There's an awful lot of it out there. Uh, they used to harvest it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the story on that? Kelp, Macrocystis pyrifera is the kelp you're talking about. It's, um, it's what we call a keystone species in a kelp bed. It needs rock rocky reef to grow on. It's kind of like an underwater forest. If you haven't seen one, I encourage you to see one. They're absolutely gorgeous and they're, they're beautiful. And um, they harvested for a long time and the companies at some point, and for a reason I can't recall now, just found it completely financially inviable to do it anymore. I'm not sure if a synthetic substitute was found or if Similar harvesting goes on in other places in the world that's just less expensive to harvest. They couldn't compete. But for whatever reason, they weren't, it wasn't so much that they were constrained out of the picture, but they just, they went out of business. Here, here, at least here in this area. Yeah, I had read a little bit about Kelco that um, they were being charged some stuff fees down in San Diego mm -hmm. that made it really prohibitively expensive and that they're um, harvesting off uh, the coast of Scotland, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, I haven't studied it, but I, but it's it's not as though the state of California said, you, "Thou shalt not har harvest kelp anymore." It's right. Okay. No. Oh, thanks. Another question. Are they thinking about um, the sanctuary putting in um, like moorings or anything, permanent moorings for people to hook up to instead of? I have never heard of any thought about that, okay. and. Um, and I wouldn't even want to speculate. But if they decided to put in things like piers and moorings, then again, this, this baseline set of data that we have and understanding of what's important to boaters would help us inform that decision. Because it seems like you know, the more data you collect, it's just going to show that it's, over, it's being overused, and therefore you have to restrict it or do something else. You know? That's going to be a hard system. Yeah, and again, my, my job is simply to supply information and insights. It's, I don't make, fortunately, have to make those decisions. Yeah. To discuss next month with Russell and Chris. Yeah, Russell will have some ideas.
Definitely. I don't want to speak for him. Yes. Has there been any movement to put no-take zones on the coastline? Of California on the continental coastline? Yes, a very big movement called the Marine Life Protection Act and Marine, Marine Life Protection Act initiative. And in fact, they just finished designating what, as I think now, the largest network of no-take marine reserves in the continental United States in the central coast of California between Pigeon Point, which is around Half Moon Bay, to Point Conception. And they were just instituted in September. And they're in the process now of working on another sort of zone or region of the coast, which they're calling the North Central Coast, which is the area north of San Francisco. Uh, it's between, let's see, it kind of incorporates Marin, Sonoma, and part of Mendocino County, I think. And <clears throat> at some point, probably next, I think, they're going to come to the Southern California region, which would include the very large and populous area between Conception and the border with Mexico, which I'm sure will be a big challenge for them. But yes, to answer your question, they are doing that. And they're using good scientific information, or they're mandated by law to use the best available science to designate those places. Is that with NOAA, or is that with the That is a completely a state process, but it also gets a lot of money from a foundation. And you could go to the Department of Fish and Game's website and read all about it. And if it comes to Southern California, they'll have a public process that you could participate in. Or I should say when it comes. I'm not sure when that will happen. The question? Is there any kind of anchor that's less, uh, has less impact on eelgrass than another? Um, I'm not going to change my answer necessarily. <laughs> right. uh, I, I don't know, actually. I think that to get to your question, the, the best thing to do is to know where, where those eelgrass beds are and avoid them. It's, they're not so large that they're impossible to avoid, really. So that's, that's the best thing. Yeah, I think you could probably Google eelgrass in Channel Islands and find this organization. Catherine could tell yes, you about yeah. those, too. And that organization clearly has all the information for voters yeah, about where it is. Like right. Like the prisoners, for instance. Right. Well. And you can see it in the water. The water is yeah. so clear. You can see yeah. the eelgrass. Right. When the visibility is good. Right, prisoners is, is an often visited place with a lot of eelgrass, but it also occurs in specific depth ranges. So just avoiding that depth range will ensure that you're not in eelgrass. Doesn't your eelgrass used to grow 10 to 15 feet? It's shallower water than most not people a lot anchor. Of people anchor in 10 to 15 no, feet. they're they're well. It depends how busy it is. I've seen people pull up huge chunks of eelgrass, and I've seen people anchoring in it. So it's just they don't know. But you know, if if you're if you're anchoring in 30 feet or deeper, yeah, you're right. You probably, I think you're almost certainly would never anchor in eelgrass. So that and right. what kind of boats, because some smaller boats might be closer in. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. or, or the anchorage and the weather and so on. Sometimes, I mean, frequently people like to get way in in shallow water, and they'll use two anchors and so on. Other questions? Lee? Uh, have sites like this been executed before in other marine sanctuaries? Or um, some of this, these, this data has been collected at the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. <clears throat> they have a similar kind of a program, but they don't have someone like me doing it. They just have people from Washington that occasionally go down. So it kind of tends to move forward, but in fits and starts. But they're also way ahead of us in that they started this about eight years before we did. Including the personal interviews with voters? Um, I think so, yeah. They, they have sort of a little different issues. For example, in Florida Keys, they were wanting to actually restore some of the degraded reef. And so they were asking people about how satisfied they are fishing and diving, for example, on, on um, artificial reefs that had been restored in different ways. So they wanted to know how that was working for people. Because they weren't restoring them just for the ecological benefits, but also for the human, human benefits. And you could go on the NOAA website. It's um, if you just Googled NOAA and socioeconomic, I bet you would find all the Florida, Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary links. Other questions? Did you go into this with preconceived <clears throat> like hypothesis on what you were expecting to find? And if so, was there anything that came out drastically different? Um, well, I haven't analyzed all the data yet, so I couldn't tell you. But I mean. 
I'm a boater, and I go out there a lot. So whether I want, want to or not, I'm sure I have some preconceived ideas of, of spatial use patterns, for example. But um, I didn't make any specific hypotheses to be tested. Once we have all the data, and we're looking at the SAMSAP data as well, the aerial flyover data, we'll probably make some working hypotheses, such as uh, reserves tend to have tended to displace fishing effort out of them into these other places. You know, in other words, people who could go to four different places and now can only go to three tend to focus more on those three and they haven't substituted another fourth spot or they have. So again, we would at some point after just looking at the data and doing some basic statistical analyses um, probably make those, state those hypotheses and then try to test them. Catherine? But on first blush, are there, in the aerial surveys alone, it didn't look like there are any fewer number of boats doing activities in those areas. No, again, it's, they it's from one side or the other, right. but it still looked like the same number. Right. Yeah, I mean, my, my, just, just looking at the data intuitively, I would say that the level of boating has increased generally over those years. Um, and just the reserves might have had some effect in, in sort of concentrating people in some areas and not in others. But again, I, I wouldn't want to speculate. And, and even when we analyze all the data, it might not be completely clear whether or not it's actually reserve effect, because as I said, there's so many factors that, ascent, that we know influence the where you, people go and what they're doing and so on. <laughs> um, no, they don't. Categorically, no, they don't, and that's that's an issue. And, and um, if you talk to the enforcement people and read their reports, you'll you'll come away with with the impression that um, of all the people that they um, that they contact, there's sort of the rule of thirds for them. And there's sort of one third of the people that tend to not really even understand that there are reserves, and therefore they didn't know they were fishing in one. Um, there is another group that seems that claims they were aware that there are reserves and kind of knows what those reserves are about, but were very uncertain about their location with respect to reserve and made a, an, perhaps an honest mistake and fished inside of one. And there's a third category of people that knew all about it and just were doing the wrong thing and trying to get away with it. <clears throat> and one big challenge is that um, unlike reserves on land, it's not that easy to just put up signage. And, uh, and the park wants to be a national natural park. And I know, and Russell Gallup can answer more about this, that they're uh, not that interested, as most parks uh, are also inclined to, to put up a whole bunch of signs in a place where people go to experience nature. But at the same time, they want to demarcate these zones. So that's a bit of a challenge. But again, GPS systems are so cheap and easy to use. And anyone who travels over 25 or 30 nautical miles of ocean generally has one these days and so can locate themselves. Well, digitally that's possible, but it costs money. It could also be, you know, I don't know if it is yet or not, but once it's into the chart plotter software. That's right. Blue charts could do it. Right. You could put it into blue charts. Other questions or comments, Lee? Uh, other than the obvious untrained guess that that was a great white, what kind of shark is that? It's a great white. A large one. A very big one. Did it have an estimate how big that was? It's a great. Very big. <laughs> big. Big enough that I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Although, this is also the perfect example of how ignorance is bliss. <laughs> Next question. Yeah, we, we would consider doing that. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, what we do has to go through a peer review, academic peer review process. And what a, any professor will tell me if I suggested that is that I might not get a representative sample if I just relied on getting data from the power squad people, because that's not necessarily, or I can't say whether it is or it isn't, a representative of the greater boating population. So while I could use that contact to get some more responses, I ult ultimately 
and seeking a random sample of the whole boater population in which every boater, theoretically at least, has the same chance of being selected and surveyed. That's what we target. Didn't some of the postcards get delivered at lunch rounds? Right, we did. So we recognize that we can't just put the, put the postcard in a slip. We had to reach out to boaters who don't keep their boat in a slip. So uh, we had the online option. We advertised in, in several periodicals saying if you're a boater, stand up and be counted. Uh, if, you, if you didn't receive this little postcard or didn't get handed one at a launch ramp, you can go to our website. And then we, we did hire people or ask people to volunteer and actually hand out these postcards at launch ramps during busy weekends to try and get that segment of the boater population. Chris, can people still go online until... They can until early November. You can go onto oceanstudy.net if you're a boater and, um, <clears throat> and take the survey. But thanks. Yeah, no, those are all, all important things. And, and for monitoring, we're, once we have a good baseline of data, we might not we might be able to, to go with a route like that. Because then when we get data, uh, we can tell who's being represented and who's not being represented once we have a good baseline. Then we then say three years later, we collect additional information. Thanks. On addition to the recreational boating, are you uh, studying the impacts of, uh, of freighter traffic and other industrialization? Um, not at this point. We'd like to at some point. Um, the sanctuary well, actually works with some people from Scripps Institute to monitor um, acoustic. They have acoustic monitoring going on, and they'd like to know what the impact on especially cetacean species, whales and porpoises and so on, is of shipping traffic. And some of you might know that blue whales have been concentrating in, in and around the shipping zone probably because their food source is there this year and several have been hit by freighters and killed. So there's that issue as well. But by the way, the Sanctuary Act doesn't allow us to tell shipping what to do. <laughs> we don't have that. We merely inform the authorities that this is happening and then it's out of our hands. Any other questions? But thank you. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. Great.